three, two, one. Never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. If you're not feeling it, you must discover why. Join Matthew Bolton in developing and applying a framework of objective optimism toward a flourishing life of meaning, health, and happiness. Here's your host, Matthew Bolton. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Brightside. I'm Matthew Bolton. Today's show is an interview with guest Danny Bader. Now, you'll learn about Danny's full bio once we get into the interview, but I'll just say for now that we've just finished recording, and I got to say that I had a great time talking to this guy. You'll see once you get in the interview how comfortable it is uh, between us because he's just a genuinely good guy and he had a lot of good ideas. I already feel better after having had the interview, and I I have like a lot of good ways he put things that I think I already understand and then he had a lot of ways of putting things that I never really heard before so it's uh, empowered me I think in my uh, moving forward to living a much better life and I hope he can do the same for you. Uh, we're going to discuss his book Back to Life and you'll hear um, the story of his near-death experience which kind of spawned that book and changed the path of his life and helped him or led him I guess to eventually develop some principles for fully living or living the best version uh, of, of himself and his life that he can live. Um, he is going to outline the five jackrabbit principles. I'm going to ask him a lot about that, or I do ask him a lot about that. I don't think there's really much more I need to say about it. We'll just take it right into the interview, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hello, everybody. Welcome now to our interview. I'm with Danny Bader. Danny is a best-selling author and sought-after speaker whose life was transformed by a near-death experience. Danny speaks to audiences nationwide, teaching people to invest in themselves, develop vision, and leverage useful thoughts to build momentum in the midst of monotony. His unique perspective and trusted voice have taken him into many Fortune 500 organizations like Marriott, Lincoln Financial, Estellas, Comcast, Merck, and others, infusing their people with the vital need for vision and inspiring them to live their best lives. Danny's reputation as an influencer in this arena continues to grow among some of the most well-respected brands and organizations nationwide. Danny's communication style connects inspiration with practicality, accelerating results for individuals and companies feeling stuck. He has researched, experimented with, and experienced the source of moving from just living and going through the motions to being uh, in, in life, excuse me, to being fully alive. And I love this, Danny. Uh, Danny's best selling book, Back to Life, has received rave reviews, reaching a number one ranking on Amazon. He also pioneered the Jackrabbit principles and energizes audiences worldwide through the Back to Life podcast. He's also the author of two other books, I Met Jesus for a Miller Light and Abraham's Diner, Simple Wisdom for Moving from Stress to Relaxed Focus and Inspiration. Danny, thanks very much for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matthew. Thanks a lot. I know we're 13 hours apart, but this works great. So thank you for having me. It's working perfect for me. I, lo I love it. So um, I think we'll get, we'll get into Back to Life maybe to start the book. And I think the, a good place to start there is to start where it started for you as a real life experienced kind of change your direction in life and spawn the book. Can you tell us about that experience to start? Sure. Yeah, Back to Life, the book is based on, um, you know, a real life event that happened when I was 28 years of age. So I was working with two friends of mine that had a, a construction a roofing company. And, uh, you know, I, I was, as a 28, I was out of college. I had had a couple of jobs and I wasn't ready for the real world. So I was tending bar and then I was doing, uh, you know, a few days of the roofing work. And this one day, July 28th, um, 1992, we were lowering a ladder towards the end of the day, a long metal ladder. And we saw some electric lines and, you know, we took a look at them and, and thought we were clear. And as it turns out, tragically, we weren't. So we, we nicked the electric line. It was like less than an inch. You know, the, the ladder was 28 feet long, 29 feet long. And we just nicked it. So it was not, um, you know, blatant negligence or anything. And the electric line had about eight to 10,000 volts of electricity in it that came down and went into myself and a friend of mine, Bruce, who was also the owner of the company, him and his brother. And in essence, we both died and I came back. Bruce did not. We lost him that day. Wonderful man, father, husband. So that, that's the event that took place. And, you know, obviously tragic. And we could talk about that. To lose Bruce was a tremendous tragedy but then the journey afterwards the book's more about the journey of this young man named jake yes. which is uh, based on my life how, how to move through that you know how really to come back to life okay so you say you were 28 and not really 
uh, I guess, would you describe a little bit more what you, where you were at in your life at that time and then how, and then how this changed you or how your direction changed? Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, you know, I graduated college and I, and I got good grades. I graduated with an accounting degree and I, and I realized senior year, I didn't want to practice accounting. So that was one of those tremendous, um, decisions I made, I guess, in majoring in accounting. So I got out and worked in a sales job and I didn't necessarily like that. And then I lived in Aspen, Colorado for a few years working out there, tending bar, yeah. you know, and skiing. So I was just trying, I was in that phase of trying to find myself. Yes. Right. You know, as a young person, I had um, a girlfriend at the time who was my wife now and we were on and off again. I just couldn't make the commitment, you know? So I was, I was just probably where a lot of young people get to after college or university where it's just like, what am I going to do? What, what is this all about? What's my purpose? What do I really like? You know, I don't want to sell my soul to corporate America and mm-hmm. those kinds of things. But, you know, it, life was at that point, it was, it was pretty good for me. You know, I, I grew up in a, a loving family. I have six brothers and a sister and, uh, you know, I was just trying to figure it out, but, but not necessarily a really bad place right then. So that's kind of where I was. And then the accident happened and that, that propelled me kind of down a dark road for, for some time Mm -hmm. where there was a lot of opportunity for resilience and growth. Yes. I'm going to talk about resilience. I think that's a very uh, interesting sounding concept to me. Um, I guess, how how do you, how did you deal with his death for the first while? You say it was a dark place. And then how did you get out of that dark place? Yeah, well, that'll probably take up most of our conversation. Okay. Um, how I, how I dealt, it's a great question, Matthew. How I dealt with Bruce's death really was, was I didn't deal with it well. Mm-hmm. So we both went to um, the first hospital and I was in one room, obviously he was in another. They came in, they let me know that he had passed and they asked if I wanted to spend, you know, a minute or two with, with him. And I didn't, I didn't, I was just too freaked out, which I regret. You know, I, I w- certainly wanted to go in and, you know, he was a good friend, pay my respects. And then about a few hours after being in that first hospital, they flew me to another hospital. They put me in a helicopter because my feet were all burned. They had holes in them. And my heart was still um, mm-hmm. a little bit irregular. So they took me to a, a, a more substantial trauma unit. And I stayed there for 10 days. And so I missed, I missed the funeral, the, you know, the burial. So I didn't have a whole lot of closure there. Yeah. And when I got out, you know, I was living with my mom and dad. Both feet were bandaged. I was on crutches. Couldn't work for a number of months. And I remember going to my, my mom took me to Bruce's grave and, you know, I, I had said no for some time. I didn't want to go. I wasn't ready. And then she took me and I remember, you know, I, I was on crutches and we walked across. I, originally I couldn't walk on either foot. Then when I got to the point where I could walk on one foot on the crutches, I remember just getting to the end, of, uh, you know, approaching his gravestone and looking down. And then I just, you know, I just lost it, man. Just every emotion imaginable. I just collapsed on the ground. You know, my mom was just kneeling next to me, you know, just sobbing with the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we make sure we, we get into the building part of everything then if we, you know, we don't have to spend all time going there. You've probably talked about that a lot in your life and you've dealt yeah. with it a lot. So um, I, let's go to something very positive. You say uh, there's a hell of a difference between just living and being alive. And I said, yeah. I love this so much. Uh, what Can you describe what you mean by that? Sure. Yeah. So for, for me, um, living is just going through the motions. Living is, is, is being defeated. Living is not having passion when you wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. Living is not working on all the key relationships in your life. So it's kind of where people are stuck, you know, with their health, their career, their spirituality, their relationships. Being alive is, is just quite, quite the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. So my experience when I came back after this accident, obviously I was just living. I was just going through the motions. I, you know, I was trying to put on a, a good face and a happy face, but I was in a real dark place mentally. And then I guess it was probably what well, happened in 92. I got married in 93. We had our first son, 94, next son in 96. So then about 98, probably six years after the accident is really where I kind of had this awakening and said, man, this is, I, I got to get back in the game here, so to speak, and not just kind of go through the motions, which you quoted earlier. So, so that's the difference for me. It doesn't have to be, you know, fully alive. It doesn't have to be that you're jumping out of planes, you know, or you're bungee jumping or, 
you know, some people think that that's it. You got to go to these, these extremes and live this totally extraordinary life. And for some people that may be, for me, it's just that you have the awareness in all these key areas of life mm-hmm. and, and you're really focused on making those key areas the best that they can be wow. with your health and your career and your wealth and your relationships and your spirituality. That's being fully alive. All right. Me. You know, for me too. And this is like, you know, I put it in terms of human flourishing, which is the, you know, it's the rough English translation of a Greek word, Aristotle's word, eudaimonia which is oh, yeah. a, you know, a state of optimal living. It's the um, integrated, contented state of health, prosperity, happiness. So mm-hmm. that's what I kind of try to promote on this show. And that's why I like to have people on like you explaining it in different ways and, and finding different ways to achieve that, which is uh, what we'll do here. Before we move on to some of the concepts that I want to ask about, just about the book, I saw some uh, reviews. I read a few reviews and I saw people referring to getting unstuck, being in need right. of a reboot, uh, creating better, better versions of themselves and, and a lot of uh, many other ones, but those are just some samples uh, sure. that were typical. Who is this book for? Yeah, I, I would say this book, and it's funny, just about an hour ago, I read the first three chapters that we're going to put out through some social media. I think the book is really for, and I'll hold it up so people can take a look at it. The, the book, and this is based on feedback that I've gotten over the years. The book is is for real, really for anybody who understands the importance of continuing to grow, moving towards the best version of themselves, um, ha- has, has been through a difficult time or maybe is going through a difficult time now. You know, there are the people that, that the feedback I get is they could connect with it. They could connect with Jake in the story and what he was struggling with, even if it wasn't the same problem or challenge that they had. Right. It, it's still, you know, Jake lost his friend in this accident. He's trying to reconcile that in his mind. You know, other people have talked to me where they lost, you know, their father, they got divorced, they lost a job. You know, one guy stood on the front um, yard of his house with his family watching the whole house burn down. Thankfully, they all got out. Mm -hmm. So it's just the principles in the book that I put together that we can talk about maybe that I call Jackrabbit are just basic principles that when the people read it, they they latch on to two or three of them and say, "Oh, oh, I need more of that right now based on where I am. So it's, it's really anybody that's open to their growth and even more so somebody that might be struggling with something right now. All right, great. Uh, I'm going to go to Jack Rabbit in a sec. I want to um, make sure I hit one, the, the idea of resilience, because I don't know sure. if we'll necessarily get, get to it if we go through the Jack Rabbit, but um, yeah. resilience, what is resilience and why is it something we ought to identify and focus on? Sure. Resilience for me, as it's defined, is, is our ability, one's ability um, mm-hmm. to move through difficult times, you know, the capacity to move through difficult times. So for me, resilience is not, you know, if you look it up a lot of times, it'll be a noun, right? It's a person, place or a thing. Yeah. But for me, uh, resilience is more of a verb. It's what, what do we do on that path? That's why I call it the path of resilience. Mm-hmm. Resilience is not that place we get to. That would yes. be your vision, right? When you're in a, mm-hmm. you're, you're in a pretty crappy time, to see the other side of it and say, okay, here's what it's going to look like when I get through there. Mm -hmm. That's the vision. The resilience is what do I need every day to give me the energy, to give me the focus, to give me the recovery, to move through that. So resilience, I think we all need it. And when you think about the definition too, that uses the word capacity, capacity is about filling something up, right? So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, how can we continue to be filled up with, with that resilience so we can run that, that path, you know, walk that path and move through these tough times. Everybody needs resilience. Everybody needs it. And everybody has to understand that there are principles that create this thing, resilience. And then there's that, that verb, that notion of action that here's what I'm doing as I'm, I'm resilient and moving through the difficult times. Okay. So resilience is a process as well, or a a practice maybe is more than as much as it is a place to get to or something, some, a thing. It's a process, would you say? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's um, yeah, it's definitely a process. So if it's a thing, it, it, it's that it's that innate quality that you have. Okay. You know, so it, it's it's the re- resilience, it's the it's the toughness, it's the stamina, it's the perseverance. You know, I would see all those as synonyms with yes. resilience. You know, it's a quality that you have. It's an outlook. You know, I saw you you had that wonderful objective optimism. I saw on one of your podcasts. You know, resilience mm-hmm. is that. It's, it's, it's a, it's a character trait. It's an energy. 
that moves okay. you through to the other place. Yeah. All right. That's much clearer. Um, I don't know if this is something you think about at all, but I just want to try it on you anyway. We hear the term snowflakes in, uh, to describe millennials. Now, I do not think in terms of groups. We're all about individuals here. And certainly, right. I think a lot of millennials are creating, building, changing the world, quite frankly. But nonetheless, there are many who, who can fit that description. And I wonder, do you think a lot of younger people these days are lacking in resilience? Uh, that's a great question. And, you know, I know that term and I've heard it before. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really do my best to stay out of judgment and labels. Sure. Is there a population of the young people that have very different beliefs than me and some of the people maybe of my generation? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because if they have those beliefs, they're going to act in different ways. Do they need yeah. more resilience? I don't know. They, they may not think they're going through a difficult time with, with you know, whatever they're in right now. Um, but I do believe that, that people that are going through the difficult times, you know, definitely need that resilience. Right. You know, a lot of times when people use that term snowflake or whatever, they're, they're just labeling the person as somebody that they think it wants everything easy, is entitled, you know, all those things we hear about the millennials. Yeah. But, you know, I've got a son, I've got nieces and nephews. I've got some millennials in my life that are kicking ass, man. I would never use that term snowflake. They're wonderful young people. That's right. And they, they have different beliefs about politics, about, you know, our oldest son, Luke, is gay. And he's a wonderful young man. So mm -hmm. I'm, I just want the person to be yes. a good person mm -hmm. and, and to bring more goodness into the world and to drive change in a positive direction. And if they can engage in that, you know, I'm happy to, to chat with them. You know, sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes people, it doesn't, doesn't matter any generation, Matthew, you know, the, the conversation is not there. It's, they're not available for conversation. They just want to make you believe their way. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's very difficult to, to converse with them. So I'll enter into it. And then if that's their, if that's their stance or their approach, I'll just politely get out of it. That's how I deal too. And that's, and that includes people in my, you know, our own generation versus sure. and, and in my university students There's some that are engaged and some are not, and I don't really have time for the latter. So yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think then as uh, leaders then, what are some of the greatest responsibilities for leaders today? Yeah. Well, I think leader, you know, leadership for me is, is the ability, they got to do a couple things. They got to set the vision for the group that they're leading. So the vision, let's imagine what needs to be real. So they got to be yeah. really clear to say, okay, all of us working together, this is what we're going to produce. Are you good with that? Are we very clear on that? Because mm -hmm. I've seen too many times where there's so much ambiguity and you know, what, what they, that vision is not real clear for people. They talk about mm -hmm. it. So number one, I think they have to have a real, clear, a real clear vision. They have to have a big, huge mirror that they look in every day uh -huh. to say, how can I grow as a person? How can I become a better, and then whatever role they are, partner, father, CEO, CFO, teacher, whatever role they are in as leader. And then, uh, you know, they have to monitor the process and really understand the people that they're leading. Mm -hmm. And they must inspire growth in those people. I think that's the key. Here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to produce. I'm always looking at myself to improve. And I want to lead you and inspire you and support you for you to become the best version of yourself as we do this. That's how yeah. I see a great leader. Right. That last part just got me that they're not just a leader doesn't just do everything. They want to inspire growth in everybody so that they get more, they get toward their goal or the common goal that they're working on together. So if you can sure. inspire growth in the people you're working with. Oh uh, yeah. If you, if you blow through your goal, you know, and, and, and exceed it with a group of people that you lead, but those people are, are no better for that as a, as a person, as an individual. And you haven't maybe crossed that proverbial line, not in an offensive way, but more in a, a heartfelt way to get to know that person mm -hmm. versus just know them in their role as a, as a business person. Yep. Now, if, if, if I think you have to leave people and have had an impact on them that, that supports them, not makes them because you can't control, no. but that supports them in growing as a that's person. Right. That, that's what I believe. That's what, that, I, that's what I try to do. And, and it, you know, and that, I know that's what you're trying to do. 
I say all the time, we're I only trying, in, we're doing it right. We're not, we're, we're not trying. We're doing it. And I, I really yeah. do. I only engage in win wins. And if it's a, if yep. it's a win lose, it always degenerates to lose, lose. And that includes if I'm the winner, even in that case, I don't want to be part of anything like that either. It's no good for oh, me. No. It doesn't no, work. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you think that resilience also applies to people who are more just kind of stuck rather than necessarily fallen or injured? Like it doesn't mean you have to come back from a great loss to have resilience, to exercise resilience, but just people who are, you know, regular day to day are just kind of not moving. They're stuck. Is that yeah. resilience? Do we need, do I need resilience to oh, get I up day so, to day yeah. and do it? Yeah. Yeah. Because resilience is a path. It's movement, right? Stuck is no movement. Okay. So, so you definitely need that resilience. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of things that I think you need. You've got to take care of yourself, right? You've got to have the vision to see the other side of it. Mm -hmm. You've got to seek support and be support to people. And then you've, you've got to engage in action. You know, there's, there's steps. We have a webinar. I have a webinar that I do called the, the Path of Resilience. And I walk people through those steps and why, why, they're, why they're important, right, to engage in them. So if, okay. if you're engaged in all of those, you can't help but to move forward. You're taking care of yourself. You're asking for help and you're being helped. You have a real clear picture of where you're going. And every day you're taking the actions to move you to that. Then you're no longer stuck. Okay. You might not be at the place that you want to be. You know, and I'm there. I'm not at the place where I want to be right now in business, yeah. right? If, if you were, then what do you do? So every year I set that new vision. And say, okay, here's the revenue goal. Here's the sales for the books. Here's my relationships with the key people in my life. Here's my health. You know, here, here's the thing that I really want to work on. Here's my spirituality. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you get to where you want to get to and you stay there, you'll be stuck again. It's yes. got to be that cycle of boom, here's where we're going. Yep, made it or came up a little short, whatever. But now here's where we're going next. All right. Okay, so I think one way we can get through this stuff is to go through the jackrabbit principles. Maybe we'll take them on one by one and flesh them out a bit sure. as we go. Um, I, but first, I'll ask you a general question about it. Why is your company called Jackrabbit? And for listeners, it's G C uh, J C K R B B T. So what's up with that? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's also the license plate on my Jeep. So all right, uh, and that, this, that's a great question because that will lead us into the first principle, if you want. And, okay. there, and there's five um, principles sure. in no order. You know, the model is very uh, uh, circular, a cycle. Yes. Sir. But um, when I was researching years ago and I said, all right, I'm going to do this little business and I'm, I'm going to put together this model. And I actually put together the model in 2007 when I went to a coaching school in Santa Barbara, the Hudson Institute. Mm -hmm. At the end of our eight month program, we could do a, um, you had to do a project. So one of them was put together a model like many coaches have, right? And okay. business people. So I thought to myself, when I had that accident in 92 and I was very close to taking my own life, and now here I am in 2007, 15 years later, mm -hmm. what principles did I practice that got me there? What mm -hmm. principles did I observe in other people and go, oh man, that Matthew, I like him. He's got something going on. What's, what's he doing? What, what's he doing? And then I, I kind of thought about that and put him into this model. So the core principle is to develop vision. Mm -hmm. So regardless of where you are, be in it, own it, but you're always looking to say, here's, here's kind of why I'm getting my butt out of bed every day. So when I thought about what would I name the company, I searched vision and animals. I was just Googling around trying to figure things out. And the jackrabbit came up and there was a paragraph I remember that said the jackrabbit of all the animals in the animal kingdom has really good vision. Its eyes are back further on its head and high up on its head. Mm -hmm. So now if I'm a jackrabbit, my eyes can essentially see the whole environment. They can see the side, the front, the back, and the air. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really cool analogy to use for us as people because we have to have that full awareness of That's what's right. happening in our life in all those areas. And then I just took the vowels out because um, you know, it looks better on a t-shirt when we put the jackrabbit logo on a t-shirt. Good enough reason as any, isn't it? Right. Um, I, have to, I have to send one over to you in South Korea there. I'll have a t-shirt. No problem. You got it. I'm, I'm, I'm all over it. I'll be wearing it uh, on my right. show and around. Um, are, are there any mistakes people make when trying to practice vision? So if they're... That you yeah, see? I, yeah, it's great. I wouldn't call them mistakes. Um, but with, with vision, it's, it's, that, it's that clear picture. It's that image. So then you got to take that philosophy of developing vision 
and you have to systematize it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So some people will do it through vision boards. They do a vision board, they, they put it up and they see it all the time right there. So that's really clear on what they're working on. An exercise that I lead people through is I have them write a letter back to themselves from the future date to say, hey, here's all the things that happened over the past six months and here's how I made them happen, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. so that when you write it in past tense, that leverages the brain because I believe our brain loves completion. Yep. So if we're right here in, you know, let's say we're in June and we're looking to the end of the year in December, we, we create a gap. It says, here's where we are, but here's the story of, of what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But you write it as if it already happened. So it closes that gap. All right. uh, I just did that exercise today with, with the group. Do it all the time and, and people love it. They've never done it. So you got to systematize that whole principle of developing a vision, right? You have, to, you have to get it into your system somewhere. And then you have to engage with it or look at it. So there's a lot of people that do vision or they do um, goal setting, maybe around January but then they never look at it mm -hmm. until later it's kind of buried. So when we do that letter exercise, we do it as an all day event on Friday in your calendar. So now every Friday comes and you're seeing that letter is right there. You kind of read it and say, Hey, how'd I do this week? And what do I have planned the next couple of weeks to kind of move me towards that? So you got to systematize it. You got to make sure you engage with it. You want it to be inspiring. And you yep. want it to generate focus, so it's got to be big enough and bold enough to yep. kind of get you excited and maybe make you a little scared or uncomfortable. If you just do one that's real easy, you know, it, it probably is not going to serve you that well. So there are some of the opportunities that, that people maybe fall short on when they're yes. doing the vision. All right. You're speaking to me here with the systematizing. I'm, always, I'm looking for systems. I'm looking for yeah. frameworks and systems to help make things simpler and automatize them once, once I know they work and then I can yep. go on to do greater thinking and work out better systems. Right. So, That's it, and then, yeah. yeah. And then being uncomfortable is another big one. Just being, you know, I kind of say if something makes me uncomfortable, I pretty much say yes yeah. <laughs> because I know I'm going to grow from it. So, Oh yeah. I, yeah, yeah entrepreneurs, it. you know, when you think about entrepreneurs, if there's risk, uncertainty, possible rejection, um, you know, people make Oof. it fun. They love that because then they go, we're getting close. Right. If that shows up. All right. Um, what do you mean by creating reality when you say that? So you develop vision and then you create reality. What does that mean? Create. Reality. Yeah, that's in, in the middle of the, the um, uh, model is the, develop vision, create reality. Creating reality is just turning your vision in, into real. So if somebody's part of a vision is losing 20 pounds and getting healthier and getting their blood pressure down to a, a lower, the creating reality is I'm here. Two months later, I'm there. I've lost this weight. My blood pressure's here. I'm off the medicine. You know, if part of my vision is to have this book sell, you know, 100,000 copies, then what's all the action that I need to do to get it to that's the reality. So the reality is simply making that story real. All right. Perfect. I, I, I just, I like to double check because sometimes creating reality, creating reality is taken to mean some form of subjectivism. Like you just kind of pretend things are as they're like, as they are not. So you kind of say, I'm going to create my own reality and pretend I'm something and attempt to be happy that way. Whereas I don't yeah. think any of that works. But if you're talking about taking what's there and building and trying to make your vision come reality, that's oh, sure. right on. Yep. Love that. That's it. That is it. Here's the story of my life for the next six months, right? That's the yep. vision. And then when you get to December 31st, you say, okay, how much of this is now real as I yeah. sit here with Excellent. my health and wealth relationships and jobs and books and everything else? Beautiful. Uh, the second one, I, you've actually given a little summary of all the um, principles as we've gone. So be still is, is maybe the next one. You said no particular order, but the next one here I've got. Be still. The practice of creating space to be still provides tremendous, tremendous physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual benefits. So can you describe the process of being still? Yeah. So being still, again, let's systematize it. And, and being still is simply that. Being still is the ability for you to kind of block out the world and, and drop into some type of stillness. How to practice that principle is, you know, I got my journal here that I, I write in probably 355 days out of the year, right? Maybe 10 I don't. It travels with me everywhere. Under here, I probably got another eight journals from the past years. Um, today, I meditated for a half hour in the middle of my day. You know, I knew we were doing this and I just wanted to kind of keep my energy. So I just do some breathing exercises. I take... Um, probably two retreats a year for two or three nights 
where I'll shut everybody out except I leave my iPhone where my wife's number can come through if it's an emergency. But other than that, I really don't talk to anybody. And I read books and I write and I say some prayers and those things and I walk in the woods. So stillness is the ability for you just to kind of get centered, get back to yourself. There's a saying that I have, it's, it's in the book. It's often in the absence of sound that you hear the most. So okay. for me, stillness allows me to connect with what I call the Holy Spirit. It's that right. simple. Okay. And that All is right. the source that, that I need in my life. Yes. I, you mentioned meditation. I was going to ask you about that, if that was an example of it. And it seems to be. Um, is that what it, now creating space? Is that what you mean? Creating space for yourself? You say you block out people and whatnot. What is that what you mean by creating space? Yeah, for me, creating space, um, you know, for me not to be distracted. Okay. So, so it's, you know, if I'm trying to create space my, for myself as I'm here in the office working, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot coming at you. You know, my phone's on, I'm getting text messages. I got social media, I got email. And they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, you really have to fight hard to get that space just for Danny, you know, yes. for, for Danny time. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of what I mean by the creating space. Many ways to practice stillness. You know, some people, and I like to run too, and I don't listen to music a whole lot. Some people will say, well, when, when I run, is that, you know, I, I kind of get in the zone. I'm not thinking about a whole lot. I say, you know, how is it for you? Does it, does it serve you well? And they go, yeah, I said, keep doing it. That's how I do. It's with, with the music too. The music just kind of is a soundtrack, essentially. My, my mind's really cool. going. I, I come up with ideas for what I want to do on the show and what, what yeah. I want to write about or think about. And uh, it really is something like that. It really is space for me out there. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's creating yeah. the space for sure. But for me, I try to get to my point where I'm really not even, I'm not thinking about anything. You know, like today, all I was focused on was my breath. Breathing in, breathe, just breath, breath, breath. And sometimes I'll do some mantra or prayer. But that's the whole thing. I really want to try to quiet my mind yes. and just, just be. Okay, just be. So it's more about emptying. It's not, so this would not be, or maybe isn't, I'm, that's what I want to understand. Is it like similar to what people call being present? Is it something like that? Or is that not it? You want to? Yeah, I think there's a lot of definitions around meditation and stillness and mindfulness. You know, there's so many of those words out there right now. Mm -hmm. it, it's just the ability for me to be with the essence of who I am, yes. with, with my spiritual beliefs is my connection to the spirit. All right. That's it. And, and it's, it's an absolute belief of mine because I had that experience where I died and I came back. So yeah. Right. Right. There was a All part right. of me that there was a part of me that didn't die and it, yes. it's still in me now. So let me go back to that space a little bit. And I, I don't go there when I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. Trust me. The spirit yes. is not there. I, yeah. I can't find anything there. It's a, it, it's, it comes in and gets in my way. It clutters my space and, right I've, on, and I've got to consciously get rid of it. And uh, yeah, as it, as it yeah. goes, and this is why you got to be vigilant in your own thinking about your own life. Cause stuff can creep in on you. I'm sure. checking out Facebook, but yeah. I love the stillness for sure. All right, then what about know thyself? This is a, a third one, the next one. Do you know yeah. yourself? It's an ongoing process and requires the simple act of asking questions and the sometimes not so simple act of answering them. So I like that. What are some kinds of questions that one might ask oneself? Uh, well, and why are me, questions powerful? Yeah, Sure. Me. For me, is uh, how can I be a better dad? How can I be a better husband? You know, I'm always looking, how can I be a better speaker? How can I be a better author? How can I be a better podcast guest? Um, what am I thinking about my world and my people in it right now? Is there another way to think about this? Yes. So it's really knowing, knowing thyself for me is like Socrates said in his – inscription there is, you know, take, take stock of thyself, know thy strengths, thy weaknesses, your spiritual heritage, your connection in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's really just me holding up that big, beautiful mirror to say, w what's Danny Bader all about? Okay. Where has he come up short? Where has he acted in a way that he doesn't want to act? So who has he been that he doesn't want to be? Mm -hmm. You know, how have I treated people? What are my thoughts about some things? It's, it's really just putting that under the microscope. There's all the questions. The questions are just how can you get better at being you? And okay. if somebody looks and goes, no, I'm as good as I could possibly be. Well, then. Yeah, good luck so with that. It, right? <laughs> yeah, they don't have to practice this principle, but I, yeah. I, I, don't, I haven't come across too many people like that. There's probably a few. Yeah, but, it, and, so, but it's the ability to take a look. You know, you can do the surveys, you can do the personality assessments, 
You can get 360 feedback if you're a leader. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways to practice knowing yourself, but it, it, it's really about just kind of really taking a look and are you being the person that you want to be? Am I the best version of Danny Bader mm -hmm. based on what I believe a human being should be? That, right. that's, what, that's what it comes down to for me. And I, I guess it's pretty obvious why the answers are not so simple. So uh, that kind of answers itself the way you describe the types of questions we have to answer. Um, sure. Would you say that some of this, this requires a lot of honesty or what you might call integrity? Oh, like objectivity? Yeah. So, Absolutely. So, is, so how key is it? Yeah. I mean, I, I assume so, but I just want to set it up. Can you tell me about? Oh yeah. I don't know how many why? times my, my kids told me, or, you know, or my wife told me, I mean, I, I battled over the years with drinking. For, you know, I, I drank as a high school and then in college, you know, just yeah. that way. And then when the accident hit, you know, drinking for me was an escape and drinking was yes. a way for me to deal with shitty times in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, those shitty times continued, right? Even when you get married and you have children. And I don't know how many times, my, you know, my kids gave me feedback about, you know, have, having too much vodka. And then I would always defend it. You don't understand. I was fine. I just was having a rough day or yeah. you'll see when you grow up. And, um, so for me to know myself at 56 is to evolve and, and to get to them and say, you know what, you're right. So, you know, a great story. I'll just share a story with you. You know, I got, I got a brother-in-law who, I only have one brother-in-law. I have six brothers and a sister. And my sister's my best friend. I love all my brothers, but my sister's probably my best. She is my best friend. Mm -hmm. And my brother-in-law, Bobby, who's, who's just a fantastic human being, wonderful man, is living with ALS, that, that brutal disease. And, um, last year I just wasn't handling it well. And there were a couple instances when we were together and it would just hit me and then I would have far too much to drink. And that happened in December, just what's that seven months ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I, I got way too drunk and next day I felt bad. The next day I talked to my wife, I talked to my kids and all, and I haven't had, I haven't had vodka in, that was my go-to. I haven't had vodka in, um, seven months. You know, I still like a Miller Lite and some red wine, but whew, mm -hmm. much, much, much more in control. And they look and they're, they, they, you know, they love me and they're proud of me. They say, right. you know what, you just can't do that, you know, because I would just drink it on the rocks with an olive or two. And just, yeah, right. you know, then in my mind, right, so here's, here's our, you know, knowing yourself, I, w I was justifying all of that. You know, it was okay because you don't understand and it's rough and can't do right. that. You know, and that's I not to my, no, I talked to my brother-in-law about it and he's, he's, he looks, he said, come on, man, don't beat yourself up. I'm still here. Let's go. Mm -hmm. He's just a, a wonderful guy. So yeah, I mean, that's, there's a prime example of, of what I'm offering to people to consider. Right. And it sounds like resilience too. I mean, you're going back and you're coming back and people are, you know, you got support. Well, that's going to be another one, the support. I'm going to get into that too. Um, but um, yeah, that's uh, a, yeah. It sounds like another question I had. Obviously, introspection is a way to know thyself, right? You got to look, you look honestly at yourself, objectively, as I would say. Like, really, don't be hiding from any facts and pretend. Oh, this is, make excuses, like you said. Oh, this is because of this and this and this, not because of my choice. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I was going to ask you how you can, how other people can help you know yourself. Uh, and and you already mentioned a couple. It sounds like your kids let you know, and your wife and your brother. But is it? I guess other people can. What can we learn about ourselves from through other people? Oh, I think you just have to be open to the feedback from other people okay. and they'll give it to Helpful. you in many different, many different ways, you know, and you just have to be open to it without any judgment for them. A lot of times people will give you feedback based on where they are in their life, right? right so right. if they're not doing too good, they'll try to give you feedback that's going to bring you down or make you guilty or make you feel bad. But you really just have to be open to any feed, any feedback that comes in and just kind of have that where you go, hmm, hmm. All right, let me consider this for a moment. And kind right. of pull, and like you said, go introspective and see if there's anything to it. And then if you've got good people in your life, which many of the listeners probably do, um, like you and I talked about earlier, the other, the negative energy, love them from a distance. That's what I say. Okay. Just love them, love them from a distance. But when you have those people that, that really, really love you and, and give you that straight feedback, you, you gotta, you know, my sister and my brother, I remember. Trish and then my older brother, Paul, we were in the driveway one time and I was married to two kids and I had a tendency just to kind of leave jobs, you know, get in there for a couple of years and then, no, this isn't working out. You don't understand. And just, I wasn't sticking with anything. 
mm-hmm. and I was getting ready to leave a job. I was working at MBNA, which was a great company, credit card company. And I, you know, I was doing well there and all, but there's some things I didn't like about it. And I remember the two of them just lit me up in the driveway. They say, you know what? You got to stop. You got to follow through on things. Nothing's going to be perfect. You got to stop quitting everything. Okay. And, and, and thankfully that was one of the best conversations I had because I stayed with it. And then I moved to the other area, which was education, learning, development. And that's why I am right now because I listened to them versus to say, no, you, you guys don't understand. That's right. Even though to, it, they don't yeah. have to understand, they just have to love you. Right. And what's yeah, sure. best for you. That's, that's all. right. If you really understand that, then you can take this stuff and would not take it personally, but yet it's about you and sure. take it. Yeah. Take it for what it's worth. The, yeah, cause I well think about said. this. Yeah. I take about this. I think about this in terms of self-esteem. I tell my students sometimes self-esteem can't be given or taken from you, given to you or taken from you from other people. Because, you know, if everybody thinks I'm a liar and I know I'm not, I, I know I'm not right. But if everyone thinks I'm the coolest guy and I know I'm a liar or a cheater, it doesn't help my self-esteem that everybody's going, oh, you're so cool. It, it doesn't matter. Yet, you can learn from hearing from other people. So when, when, people, when enough people say, you know, he's, this guy's kind of a jerk, I might have to look and think, look at myself a little more. So it can help you with your introspection. It's ultimately your own knowing thyself is you, you know better than anybody. But yeah. it's, it is, you can really get a lot of help from listening to other people and, and uh, as you've described in good detail. Yeah. And sometimes self-esteem is knowing that you can do something, right? You have the ability to do something. It's that, it's that self-love. So there's that two, the self-esteem. Yes, I'm good. I have the capability. I can do this. Self-love is just really being comfortable with who you are, how you are, um, and who you're being. It really doesn't have any, for me, anything to do with what you can produce. Mm-hmm. It's more of how, how am I going about producing that? I guess right. what's the approach to that? You know, in the book I talk about, there's some guys in there, Brendan and Paul, and when they're talking about knowing thyself, you know, Brendan says, you know, I was a pretty good speaker. He had written some books in, in, in this book. He was a writer and a speaker. Mm-hmm. And he said, I knew that I was a pretty good speaker. So I had the ability to do that. And then he talks about where he really shifted and did that with love from a place mm-hmm. of love versus, you know, I'm writing books, I'm making money. And, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, so the ability to really kind of look at yourself. All right. Excellent, Danny. Um, let's move on. Oh, uh, actually not move on. I just said, you said it's an ongoing process. I, I just want to highlight that point before we move to the next principle An ongoing process. What do you mean? It's an ongoing process. I mean, it could be obvious, but maybe again, I want you to articulate for us. Yeah. So, the ongoing process of knowing yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the main things of knowing yourself is your beliefs and your mindset and your beliefs are your convictions that you hold to be true in your mind, right? These are the beliefs I have about people, events, situations, political parties, any of that. So your, your beliefs are, you always have to look at them because your world is forever dynamic, right? It's not static. So you always got to be thinking about how you're thinking and where is there an opportunity for me to grow in that? Because your beliefs about a certain area of your life then form your mindset, which is your attitude about that. And and if all you know, folks understand, you know, I I have a ring, a very simple four circle ring that says everything we create in our life comes from the actions that we take, and that comes from our feelings and our emotions, and that comes from how we think. Yes. So if you look at a lot of the the, the beliefs and mindset, a lot of the, the the tension in America right now, the horrible times that we're going through, it it's the beliefs that people have about political parties, about political leaders, about the police, Mm -hmm. about, you know, black people and and race and all it's, it's the beliefs. See, people aren't in conflict. It's, it's their beliefs that conflict. So, um, yeah, I I think you always have to look at that and man, do we have to look at it so much right now in this country? Yeah. Individuals need to check their own beliefs, right? I mean, it's, that's what we're at. Yeah. You got it. We could, we could go into that, but we won't. No, we don't need to go all there. I like just sticking with this this positive uh, framework you've got here. I, it's, I think it's already I'm getting a lot more adding to or bulking up what I already kind of understand, think I understand, and it's really sure. helpful. So I want to keep moving Great. on here. Uh, the, the, the next principle is seek support. And you I hinted at that already. It says many people are trying to go it alone in this life when they are anything but alone. Our support networks, both external and internal, are vital to us. So what's an example of a support network? And how yeah, might so we use one? 
Yeah, absolutely. Great question. You do ask great questions. Oh. The, um, the support network, external and internal. So external would be number one people. Mm -hmm. I had so many people around to help me when I went through that accident, but I didn't let them in, right? Because they don't understand what I'm going through. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. you, you, people exclude. There are people out there that love you and will support you, but we often exclude them because they, they don't understand what I'm going through. My husband cheated on me. My wife cheated on me. I just got laid off. My kid, my, my child is, is, is sick. They don't, ha again, they don't have to understand that because they've never experienced that maybe. And that's where the understanding comes from, right? Our understanding comes from having experienced something. So be okay yes. that they don't understand it, but if they're showing up and it's coming from a place of love, there's some, some support there for you. So it's the external is really about people. It's also about, what do we do for ourselves every day to support ourselves? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm constantly listening to podcasts. I get, gosh, I must get seven or eight daily emails from different, you know, coaches and speakers and, and spiritual people. Eckhart Tolle, I love when I get his. Pastor Rick Warren. I mean, I, I get them all. That I get one from the Stoic philosophy. It, it sounds like when you were talking a little bit there, um, you know, the, the Stoics. And I just love those emails because every morning they kind of support me and okay, where am I? Where's my head? What's my mood like? Let me take in some information from some people and see how maybe I can apply that. And then, you know, the Ted talks and the YouTube and everything else. I got one on my phone right now that I was just watching. I just came across some uh, life coach followed me on Instagram. I looked, saw her Ted talk. It's 12. I'm going to listen to see what she has to say. Yeah, right. You know, I think about uh, discomfort. So, so what do you, what are you doing to support yourself externally? Okay. okay. That, so those are all external then too, the other ones, yeah. or is that part of what, okay. So what is the, what is external versus internal support then? What's the internal support system? Internal support for me would be um, prayer, quiet time, you know, kind of the stillness thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Primarily, primarily my internal support is prayer. Right. Okay. And one's not necessarily more important than the other. I mean, these external support systems are so vital, but yet internals equally as vital. Would you say? Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. absolutely. Heart versus brain or whatever. You got it. All right. 18 All right. inches there. Right. It's a, okay. It's a, but you're interesting, you know, when you talk about that and, and knowing yourself too, we as a human being, if you think about it, what's more important of those, mm -hmm. you, you can be brain dead. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you can man. be brain. You can be brain dead and still function. You can't be heart dead, right? Okay, that that's so the kind I, of way that I, I I frame it. You can't. So one is the, one is the MVP, the real MVP. Then, <laughs> well, I, I go with heart. Yeah, I think yeah. that's where it is. You know, it's got it's got a lot of electric electricity in there. There's a field where they can pick up on it. Yeah. There's a great um, company out on the west coast of, of uh, the United States called Heart Math. Uh -huh. that really has studied the heart and the energy that it transmits yep. and the signal that it shows off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you can, they can pick up heart energy from people eight to 10 feet away. Okay. And that's why when we're with somebody in a room, we go, man, I just, they just make me feel better. I just like when I'm around them, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they can say, man, I, when you walk into a room, something's different. I think that's all coming from here. Yes. And that's an energy that's much bigger than us as human beings. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that, that, yeah, it seems automatic. And yet we, we'd have said earlier that, that our feelings come from our thoughts and ideas. We can change them by changing our thoughts. So when I see yeah. somebody in a room, I might feel it's because my, my lightning judgment of what this person is, is about, I can respond to that. Or I don't like someone my wife can talk about it on the way home. Why didn't we like that guy? <laughs> but, but you really, no, have to we're figure still going to do that once in a while. That's probably just part yeah. of being human. Yes. <coughs> Um, what, uh, one more question on this. I'm just curious if you have a, have a view on this. Why do you think people do try to go it alone? So many people do. What is this? Oh, I, I, I know asking for weakness is a, asking for help is a sign of weakness. That that's the, the main belief that I think I just did a podcast with, um, um, Dr. Margaret Rutherford. She wrote a, a great book called, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. Um, perfect depression. Okay. And one of the things that her and I talked about in the podcast is that inability for people to ask for help mm -hmm. because then they think it, 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 they're, they're weak. They're not strong enough. They're not perfect. They're not good enough. I think it really comes out of that main belief that so many 
of us have of, of I'm not good enough. In, I'm inadequate, mm. you know, okay. or, you know, and with that is they, they don't understand what I'm going through. So they can't help me. Right. That one. Yeah. That's a, that's when I didn't really get much. I kind of, I, I, I was, had a hint of the idea of people not bonding to be appear weak, but uh, I didn't really get that other one. So it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly not too proud to have a, you know, look for external support. I'm looking, I'm always looking to, to delegate to, to establish systems and, and figure things out from anybody. I'll take Did anything. Did you do that always as a youngster growing up and all? Uh, I don't, I don't know how consciously I was, I was doing it. Let's say if when I, I try to do that, sometimes I try to look back and, and say, how much of me and, who, and how I am is similar to me then? And there's a lot of stuff about my general energy and enthusiasm a lot of my friends can make fun of me for and still do today. But yet my conscious ideas and how deliberate I am about thinking about things and systematizing mm -hmm. things and looking for ideas and all that, that's all post, you know, 24 years old. So it, it was, a, yeah, it's a different, a different thing. So it's hard for me to answer that question exactly, but certainly not deliberate. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, well, and uh, well, so I just mentioned there was an evolution there from when I was younger to now and my, you know, uh, being deliberate, as I'll put it, purposeful. And you've got evolve is the final principle here. It says the power in reflecting on the happenings in our lives, both positive and negative, and growing from them is a vital practice. So how can we use positive and negative experiences to help us grow? Yeah, I think it's that, you know, Abraham Lincoln, who was a great president here in the U.S., he said, we dare not disregard the lessons of experience. Yeah. So for to evolve is for me to continually watch all the experiences that I have in life daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, big things, and just say, how, how can I grow out of that? And a lot of evolve comes from practicing the other four principles of Jackrabbit. We're continually growing if we, we develop a bold vision for ourselves. We continue to practice stillness and become more mindful. We continue to monitor ourselves, right, and, and know ourselves and look at our mindsets and our belief. We continue to ask for support from people and also to be support. That, that, yes. that support principle has two sides to it. Okay. So I would encourage anybody listening right now just to slow down or watching. There, there is likely somebody in your life that needs you more than you're showing up for them right now. Okay. You got it? There's likely somebody in your life that needs you more than you're showing up right now. And it's not because you're not a good person. It's right. just because life sometimes moves so fast with such a, a, a tremendous amount of distraction that we miss that somebody needs us. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, that, that seek support and be support. So for me, you know, sometimes when I do the webinars or, or the, the in person, when we were traveling here, people would say, okay, I understand that principles of Jackrabbit, the first four, and it's great. You showed me how to do them. So it's just not self-help theory. You show me how I can incorporate them into my day. How do I evolve? How do I practice that fifth principle? And I say, just keep doing the other four. And okay. there's no way that you will not grow and move on. But it's just learning from life and, and continuing to work your principles and your approach, you know, every day, every year. Right. Yeah. It's, well, you say it's practicing the other four. And I think this idea of reflection and growth, it sounds very similar to maybe you've seen what I call think and thrive. So again, oh, yeah. thrive, thrive is the summary, summary goal, what we're trying to achieve, what you call being fully alive, living an optimal mm -hmm. life that's thriving. And then the, the summary means to it is thinking, which is reflection and practicing the principles of principles of jackrabbit as I can maybe yeah. I can refer to it now, which is very sure. uh, helpful for me. Um, and uh, I guess I, I like the idea of evolution as well, because it sounds like it's all you say you mentioned growth. It's all about growth progress. And I think that life is a, a process of progress. It's basically, yeah. there is no stagnation, like being stagnation is actually regression in my view, which is ultimately death you could say. So you really need to, to grow or you, you're gone. So what do you yeah. say to that idea? Does that, sound like what oh, you're talking I, I about? I agree with you a hundred percent. You know, if you, if you either grow or you go, I absolutely <laughs> agree with that. Okay. You have to, you, you know, you have to every day continue to, to move through these challenges that you have and, you know, define your own growth. What does that look like? Well, for me, it's just growing in those key areas of life and being the best version of Danny Bader that I can be yeah. and continuing to influence and inspire others on their journey of life. You know, that if I'm doing that, I'm continuing to grow. 
That's excellent. Um, generally on it, do you, do you have a, a particular a favorite principle, let's say, one that's more kind of the key? You know, I used, I used to love, I mean, I love them all. I, I used to really, I would an answer the great question. I would, I would answer the question that it was vision, you know, that yeah. ability to imagine what needs to be real. But as I've gotten to work more on the beliefs and my mindset and really how am I thinking about what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. and, and done it more um, authentically as Danny yeah. versus, oh, I should probably think this way based on, you know, mm -hmm. my parents around or my mom, but just to really be Danny, that's been pretty cool too. And okay. to just get a little bigger and bolder with my beliefs about life and possibility and relationships and love and all that. All right. Well, how, how about this outside of Danny then? Or how, where have you seen other people practice Jackrabbit? And you may be some examples of that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have yeah. seen an awful lot of people who, who write that vision every year now. Mm -hmm. You know, I had the, the, the pleasure, I've had the pleasure and it will continue again as we move through this tough time, but working with Marriott and Ritz Carlton leaders, I get people all the time that are sending me to say, Hey, I wrote my letter this year. A lot of it happened. I still do it. Um, the mindsets and beliefs are something that come back a lot where people go, yeah, I have an opportunity here to think a little bit differently about this situation. And then the stillness when people get that. And that's probably the one people struggle with the most. I hear from them. Oh, I, I can't meditate. I can't be still. I can't turn off my mind. I don't have time. Although once they get it, they, they come back and go, man, that's that's the special sauce there. Just disconnect a <laughs> couple, couple, couple times a day and just, you know, I don't know how many times I sit in this chair, turn my phone off and right where I am now, I just, just really slow and drop into my breath. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'll tell you what, people mentioned a reboot and I've been very, um, I found myself getting caught into down of the Facebook world a little bit more more often recently and i remember it happened a few years ago and then i just totally made a whole new plan and shut it off and just things opened up for me and i guess space opened up i put it now and i just enjoyed a better quality of life and i found myself enjoying a lot of things these days recently but yet that's been kind of cutting into it and i've been talking to my wife recently like i gotta i'm gonna have to re set up a new plan here and and make a commitment to something. And I think you've just pushed me over the edge now with this idea of calling it the special sauce. So I appreciate that. I'm, oh yeah. 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 I, I and just, especially yeah. where you are in South Korea, I got to think that meditation is, is probably a part of the culture over there. Yes. There's a, uh, well, there's a whole, there's a lot of, um, there's a, actually Christianity is the biggest religion here. And then there's also a lot of Buddhism and then there's a whole culture of Confucianism so mm -hmm. I guess my, my, my wife's mother is a Catholic and then her father's a Buddhist, but, mm -hmm. um, and he's really big on that kind of thing. He's trying to, cool. uh, he's really getting into his, uh, preachy, uh, period where he's just trying to download everything onto us. Cause he's, you know, feeling, feeling a little tired, I think. And he's just like, wants yeah. to share everything. And he's all about sh sharing his books and saying, you gotta that's cool. Meditate, though, that's think. A, that's a still. good combination, man. You got Jesus oh. and Buddha in the house. That's good. <laughs> that yeah, is we're good. We're doing very well in our I'm world. I'm actually here. reading a book now called Siddhartha's Brain, which talks about, and it's kind of tied into meditation, but it's the whole story of the Buddha and how he became the Buddha and oh, there's yeah. science in there. It's a pretty cool book. Siddhartha's Brain, it's called. Sid Arthur's? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, like we could go into so many things here. Um, we are getting closer, close to our hour. There, there's one that I really want to hit though, just because I think it's such a key concept in, in my life. And I think it's one people are looking for all the time. Yeah, let's you hit mentioned, it. Let's hit you it. mentioned purpose, right? Yes. Purpose is something that you, you talk about. And well, what is purpose in your view? Well, you know, that, that's such a good question because pur purpose always yeah. comes back that's why I wanted different answers. <laughs> yeah, it always comes back to the why. And, you know, for me, it was interesting because when I came back to life, literally, you know, because, we, you know, we have strong Catholic faith in my family. You know, it's, it's, it's why are you back? God has a plan for you. So it was all attached to, you know, to my spiritual beliefs. Um, for me, purpose is the why, I guess, is the best way, even though that word I think is overused is, is why, why do you get your butt out of bed every day? How, how will you know that you purpose is what you do and, and the people that you serve? How will you know if you fulfilled that? And I, I think it's gotta be 
for purpose to be really strong for people, I think it's got to be in service to others. Mm-hmm. And it's got to be um, to the betterment of people, the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. So the purpose that I've settled on is, is to connect with spirit and support my family, friends, and other people on this wonderful journey called life. That, okay. that for me is, is why I get my butt out of bed. And some days when I don't feel like getting my butt out of bed, because like all of us, you know, you get into those places where you're in a little funk. If I just think about that, then I'm like, you know what? There may be somebody whose path I crossed today, and it could be through a podcast. It could be through them getting my book. It could be on Facebook. It could be anywhere. But there may be somebody that I cross paths with today that because we did, I supported them somehow. And that's what, and that doesn't come, that doesn't come from ego, but that comes from service. If, if, if Danny Bader can have a positive influence on somebody and support them in moving through a tough time and towards a better time, then, then let's go. And that's all all I want to do until, until I die again. Yeah. Oh, well, no hurry though. No hurry. No, certainly. I hope not. I mean, yeah. Well, I like the, I like the way that's put. I think about, yeah, you can think about it in terms of service. I might say adding value. I want to add value to people's lives. And I told you, I don't want to be part of any win lose or else what's the point of it. So you can, I guess the, the, the trouble is, I guess in the day to day life these days, maybe I wonder sometimes if it's hard to find, how can I add value when when everything's so good and there's nothing, there's nothing dire. I mean, I shouldn't say there's nothing dire at all, but in most people's day-to-day lives, there's not, life's pretty good. This is one of the themes of my show. It's like, you got to appreciate that we're, we have better, more time and more, better opportunity. So Mm -hmm. I find that people, I think back in the day, it was easier. It was like, you got to survive. You got to work hard just to survive. And that's your moral purpose to, to get up. And it's, I wonder how we might find the heroic in the day-to-day these days. Or, and I guess maybe, you would say, think about how can I serve somebody to, how can I add value? Yeah, how can I me, be valuable? Just, yep. That's great, Matthew. For me, it's just, how can I be the best version of Danny Bader so that I can serve other people? Yeah. And, and, and when my time is finished again here on this planet, in this existence, that there would be a great many people, again, not out of ego, but would say, I'm glad I crossed paths with that guy. Right. He, All right. he helped to make my life a little better. All right. Well, I'm, it's very obvious that that's, that's going to be happening if this is your attitude and you stick with it. And of course, I, I understand you already have uh, influenced loads of people along the way. So um, I guess we're going to, we'll wrap it up here. But I wonder if there's anything that, uh, that you would like to say that I didn't, didn't ask you about or something, something you would like to go for? You know, you, you did a really a great job in all those questions. And no, I, I think, you know, the, the people who are listening or watching, I'm trusting that somewhere in our conversation, we gave them two or three things to consider that they can go out and experiment with, right? Because life's just one big experiment. Experiment with, it's going to drive, you know, greater levels of happiness, fulfillment, and resilience. Mm-hmm. I agree with all that. Okay, then. So I'm going to give a final word. I'm going to ask, uh, ask you to let people know where they can find you. But first, I'll just say a final word before we sign up. Just as Danny was saying, if you find anything in this at all, you should share it because you never know when one of these ideas or maybe a couple might reach one person. And that's all we can do is change individual minds and individual lives as we go along. So mm-hmm. share it with somebody who you think uh, might get value from this. I'm, and um, you may ask questions or make comments uh, I think the best place to do that is go to the Mr. Brightside Facebook page. You can do that uh, at facebook.com slash matthewbolton.ca. Go there, ask questions. If we want to hear any elaboration, I'll forward or redirect anything that's directed at Danny to him. Make sure he gets it. Yeah. All right. Um, now, Danny, where should people go if they want to connect with you or learn more about you and your work? That's great. Thank you, Matthew. Well, they could certainly go to my website is dannybader.com www.dannybader.com. And on there, there's, there's an awful lot. And there's links to my podcast, Back to Life is on there. There's links to all the books, you know, Back to Life. I met Jesus for Miller Lite and Abraham's Diner. We've got my YouTube channel, Danny Bader. They could search a lot of videos on there they could listen to. And then, you know, Instagram and Facebook as well. Instagram is underscore Danny Bader and Facebook, you would just find Danny Bader out there. So lots all of right. places they could go. You know, I would encourage them to, um, Take a look if, if they're feeling like they, they might want to think a little differently. Maybe there's something in there that I could offer them. But I, I do wish them all the best as they travel this journey called life. 
Excellent. Well, Danny, thanks very much. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation a lot. I just feel better now. Uh, you know, you give me a bit of a reboot as, as uh, I say, and I'm really going to be paying a lot of attention to you now and looking more into your stuff. So That's um, great. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks very much. Yeah. I appreciate the work you're doing and, and send me your address. I'll send some books and a t-shirt for you and your wife. Sounds excellent. Uh, and All to right, everybody thanks else. Thanks very much, man. Okay. And to everybody else, I said, you heard it from Danny. Go check out Danny Bader. Go make your vision a reality today. And I'll see you guys next time. Mr. Brightside, your time out to refresh, refuel, and refocus your mind and energy toward building an optimistic framework for flourishing. Life is good. It's up to you to choose the bright side.